fundamentals. Do you think World War III is on the horizon? Well, I don't know about World War III, uh, although it certainly could happen at some point. But I think the fact that Donald Trump is already you know, dropping bombs on Syria within the first 100 days uh, of uh, being president shows that anybody who believes that Donald Trump was going to usher in an era of a new non-interventionist foreign policy, I uh, better do some rethinking. Uh, because he seems to have fallen into line very quickly with the patterns established by traditional Republicans and Democrats, you know, to drop bombs first and, you know, ask questions later. And, and even it's even possible that the Trump administration decided to do this to take some of the political heat off Trump and to kind of rally the country around this new war effort. You know, whenever, you know, we start dropping bombs on somebody, Nobody wants to be critical because nobody wants to be accused of not being a patriot. So everybody kind of rallies around the commander in chief whenever there's some kind of military intervention. And in fact, Donald Trump has already drawn a lot of praise from his critics because now he's acting presidential right? because he's, he's bombing people. Are you surprised how the media has acted? I mean, first of all, they've been in a hysteria over him for the last six months, maybe maybe last year and a half. But. Man, he started dropping bombs on Syria, and you've got, uh, I forgot what that CNN guy, guy uh, the, he was telling, that this is the first day Trump's been president. They're, they're going crazy. They love it. CNN loves that because it's good ratings, you know, bombs. I mean, CNN was built on the Gulf War. I mean, that's where CNN, uh, you know, basically came to, to uh, you know, to be what it is today. I mean, it was out before the Gulf War, but that's when it really rose to prominence was that, you know, 24 hour coverage of, of what was going on in, you know, uh, in Kuwait and Iraq. And so, yeah, they love this stuff. But, you know, Donald Trump should already be disappointing a lot of people who thought we were going to get changed. We were going to make America great again. You know, we didn't repeal Obamacare. That's here to stay. Major tax reform is dead. Uh, you know, we're, we're dropping bombs. I mean, it's the same old, same old, right? Big government, bigger deficits, more cheap money, more, you know, keep the air in the bubble. We're headed for a major, major crisis. Peter, with the uh, debt ceiling being maxed out on the on March fifteenth, I haven't I haven't even seen it play out in the media at all. Uh, do you think that uh, everyone kind of assumes that it's going to be easy to uh, extend it, much like repeal and replace Obamacare was supposed to be with a Republican Congress? Well, I think it'll be much easier to get the debt limit raised because I'm sure the, the president will be able to get Democrat support for more debt. Uh, so it might be there might be some conservative opposition to it, but there'll be plenty of Democrats that will join on with most Republicans. So I don't think, you know, the crisis is not the debt ceiling. The crisis is the debt. I mean, if the ceiling were just permanent, that would help mitigate the crisis. But no, I mean, they keep raising the ceiling every time we hit it. And so the debt gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the only thing that's going to bring it uh, back down is going to be a currency crisis, which, you know, is in our future. Uh, looking at the Fed hikes, gold has done very well. From hike to hike, it just keeps going up, and it looks like we're going to have another hike, and gold's, gold's rallying today. Um, well, I don't know about another hike. We'll see. But gold's up now 10% so far in 2017. And, you know, the Dow Jones is only up 4% this year. You know, the Dow gets all the headlines, but gold is uh, getting all the performance. And, you know, I think the Dow is going to finish the year negative. I think that we're going to have a pretty weak second half as a lot of the uh, Trump uh, mania uh, catches up to reality because we had this huge run up in the stock market based on the higher GDP growth that we were going to get from repealing Obamacare and reforming the tax code. And since those things are not going to happen, uh, we're not going to get uh, the, the, the strong economic growth. We're not going to get the boost to corporate earnings. In fact, you know, a first quarter GDP, the estimate now from the Atlanta Fed is just 0.6 percent, which would be the weakest quarter in many years if that were the case. And in fact, the Atlanta Fed was projecting 3.4 percent GDP growth for Q1 as late as February 1st. So we've had a rapid deterioration in the economic growth outlook. There is no fiscal help on the horizon. Uh, so this stock market rally should fizzle. And so should the rally that we had in the dollar. And that will be very bullish for gold. And in fact, gold stocks still have a long way to go. You know, I was just looking, even though gold is at a new high for the year, the GDX would have to rise 7% to get back to its February high. And the GDXJ, the junior gold mining stock index, would have to rise 16% from here just to get back to where it was in February, even though the price of gold today is higher than it was back then. 
So we had a very, very big correction in the gold stocks, uh, even though we've had no correction really in the price of gold because it's on the highs. That's interesting because it's almost like a, a um, I don't want to say hidden bull market, but it's a bull market uh, that many people aren't fully embracing. And it could be because of the bear market that we had, especially in the shares. Uh, over the last five years up until about late 2015. Is that typically normal in, in an early stage of a bull market, whether it's the shares or physical gold you're talking about? Because a lot of people haven't fully embraced it yet, and they actually feel this little correction feels like they're back in 2014 again. But really, things are uh, very, very positive, right? Yeah, well, you know, bull markets climb a wall of worry, and that is exactly what's happening. Although with gold, it's kind of the opposite in that people who buy gold are worried about things, right? People are buying gold because they see problems on the horizon. And so in a this gold bull market, what's actually happening is people are optimistic, and so they're not buying gold, right? A lot of the gold buyers are Trump voters, right? Uh, most people who voted for Hillary Clinton probably don't buy gold. In fact, most people don't buy gold at all, but to the extent that people are buying gold, they're much more likely to be Republicans and you know, have been Trump supporters. And so these individuals are as optimistic as they've been in a long time. And you have to go back to the election of Ronald Reagan, really, to find this much optimism on the part of Republican voters. And, you know, so they're not buying gold. You know, people don't buy gold when they think everything is great. If they think Trump is going to make America great again and fix all the problems in the economy and the stock market's going to boom, then why do you want to own gold? So you have all of these enthusiastic Trump voters to not buying gold because they're optimistic, yet the price of gold keeps rising and rising and rising, and they're missing out, I think, on what is going to be an enormous gain. It's going to be a while before some of these Trump voters have to uh, face reality. Do you, Peter, Peter, I was going to ask you, when you invest in gold, do you completely separate the, the aspect of, of gold and then the mining shares? Because the mining shares, I mean, you could have the major companies or you could have the junior mining companies, which are, which are extremely speculative. Do you even consider a junior mining share or a barrack, for example, a large cap, as part of your gold portfolio? Or do you keep your physical precious metals separate from the side that owns stocks? No, I mean, I all look at it as exposure to gold. I mean, the, the least risky way to own it is, you know, just to own gold. And that's kind of like your liquidity. That's, you know, like money in the bank, except I think it's better because money in the bank, A, the bank could fail and B, the money is definitely going to fail. Uh, so I'd much rather have gold and, you know, a great place to store your gold, at least a, a portion of it, is that gold money, which is the company that I'm dealing with where, you know, you actually are able to monetize your gold because gold that you store in a vault through gold money uh, can be used in commerce, can be used in e-commerce. You can buy things with it. Uh, you know, you can spend it like cash, except it doesn't lose value between the time you deposit it and the time you spend it. And of course, you can even earn it. If you have a business, you can start accepting payments in gold and you can start accumulating gold uh, and earning gold instead of instead of currency. But as far as gold stocks, they're more aggressive. I mean, obviously, a company like a, a Barrick Gold or Newmont, these big gold companies, uh, they're going to go up if the price of gold goes up. Um, because they have the gold. And as pro as prices go up, the impact on their profits is rather dramatic. So if you get a 20% increase in the price of gold, uh, that does a lot more than increase the profits of a gold company by 20%. I mean, it, it could increase the profits of a gold company by 100%. Uh, so if your profits double, then, you know, all else being equal, the price of the stock should double. So you get a tremendous amount of leverage to the price of gold when you own these gold mining companies without having to borrow any money. Because the other way you get the leverage in gold is to, you know, borrow money to buy it. People do that in futures contracts or they use options. So I think gold stocks are a better way to lever to the price of gold than just going into debt. And then you mentioned these junior miners. I mean, those things uh, potentially have the most leverage of all. Of course, they have the most risk if the price of gold doesn't rise. But if you get a significant increase in the price of gold, uh, you know, these things could go up, you know, 10 times, 20 times. I mean, if you buy the right one. But, of course, you know, you want to diversify. When you're buying the exploration companies, junior mining companies, the key is to have a portfolio. Don't just put all your eggs in one basket and hope that, that you found the right one. You know, you got to spread it around. And I like funds, you know, that, that do that. I mean, we have a fund, the Euro Pacific Capital Gold Fund, EPGFX is a symbol for my gold fund. So I think, you know, we have a lot of junior miners in our fund. And I think 
When you're trying to buy the juniors, it's just best to buy a fund rather than trying to pick the individual winners yourself. You know, you want to diversify your holdings. Don't just put all your eggs in one basket and, and hope that you chose the right basket. So just pick a fund. You know, my fund, the Euro Pacific uh, Gold Fund, EPGFX, is managed by Adrian Day. You know, Adrian's been managing in this space for over 30 years, uh, operating in the, in the gold mining sectors, you know, with a lot of work in the junior uh, miners. And so rather than doing the work yourself, just hire Adrian Day to do it for you. He's got a great track record. That's why I hired him to manage my fund. Even I don't necessarily trust myself in this space. It's a very, very difficult space to understand. There are so many ways to screw up. Uh, you know, there are so many landmines, right? Literally masquerading as gold mines. So you need a guy like Adrian who really, you know, eats and sleeps and lives uh, this sector and who's been doing it exclusively uh, to be your guy. You know, in our fund, I think we were the number one gold fund last year. I mean, technically, there was one gold fund that beat us, but the guy that beat us has two funds last year and one was like a horrible. So if you average his two funds, we kicked his butt. So, you know, we did great. Uh, and, and I so and I think Adrian is going to do fantastic. That's why I hired him to manage my fund. And so you know you can hire him yourself. All you have to do is buy the fund. You know, you know EPGFX is the symbol. Check it out. Read the prospectus. Understand the risks. Of course, you know investing in gold stocks is risky. If the price of gold goes down, the price of gold stocks will go down even more. So make sure you understand that before you invest. Sure, the symbol EPGFX will definitely have that up for everybody. And certainly having Adrian Day manage your gold stock portfolio. Uh, is a much better idea than just buying a, a, a random junior mining stock. Cause I can tell you just being in the industry that it's, uh, my goodness, I would say the scams outweigh the good guys by nine to 10. And this is where too index investing is not the way to go. I mean, this is where doing your homework and being smart can add tremendous value over time, right? It's, you know, just having a guy understand the companies and being able to avoid the landmines, right? And just be in the gold mines. It's well worth the small management fee that you're paying uh, to have, you know, somebody really, uh, you know, separating, the, the, you know, the wheat from the chaff. Uh, Peter, before we uh, close out, I wanted to ask you about the U.S. dollar. We've seen China and Russia make big moves, and this is not new. This has been going on for a long time. Uh, what is the state of the, of the U.S. currency? Is it still going to be the reserve currency 10 years from now? Well, who knows? I mean, 10 years from now, maybe not. We'll see, you know. Uh, if you asked me that question 10 years ago, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have said, you know, I, I would have had kind of the same answer. Um, and it still is. But, you know, it, it, we're, the dollar is living on borrowed time, literally. And so we just don't know. You know, it's like a, it's like a bomb with a fuse, but we just don't really know how long the fuse is, you know. But um, the dollar, I think, is in a major bubble. I think it is in the process of topping out. I think once it completes this top, it's going down. And I think it's going to take out the lows from 2008. In, in 2008, the dollar index got down to um, 70 approximately. That was the record low. Prior to that, the record low on the dollar index was about 80. And so I think we're going to take out the low of 70. I think it'll happen in the first term of Trump. I mean, assuming there is a second term, which is a stretch, there may not be, it may only be, may only have one term. And during that term, I think the dollar is going to hit a new record low in the dollar index. I think the U.S. economy is going into recession. I think the Fed is going to take back the minimal rate hikes. I think we're going to go back to QE. I think the balance sheet's going to explode. I think we have a lot of other problems that are going to blow up, you know, early in the, the Trump presidency. And that's going to drive the dollar down. The difference between this dollar uh, sell-off and the last one is I don't think it's going to be saved by the bell. I think it's going to go down for the count because the last time what saved the dollar was the financial crisis. And that crisis resulted in everybody buying the dollar. But I think the next crisis is not going to be uh, the same type of crisis that we had in 08. I think the dollar is going to be the crisis. I don't think it's going to be a, you know, a bread and butter financial crisis. This is going to be a currency crisis. So it's going to be the U.S. government. It's not going to be the mortgage market that's blowing up. It's going to be the treasury bond market that's blowing up. Uh, it's going to be the Federal Reserve that's blowing up. And this is going to be a major, major negative for the dollar, not a positive. Uh, Peter, do you think Trump, when he, you know, was with the Treasury Secretary and certainly in the past few months 
uh, could have quite possibly learned that, um, you know, all these things he said on the campaign trail about calling China a currency manipulator or going toe to toe and having some some sort of trade war with some of these countries. Do you think he could have learned that, hey, Saudi Arabia is helping keeping the U.S. dollar propped up. China is helping keeping the U.S. dollar propped up, that perhaps maybe they're allowed to do some of these things because it's us simply reimbursing them for helping us keep our currency propped up. Well, I don't know what uh, Trump's advisors understand. I mean, we we have a huge uh, imbalance of trade. We have a huge deficit. That is a major problem in the long run. In the short run, it is a panacea. In the short run, we benefit from the trade deficit because we get to consume more than we produce. We get to live beyond our means. The trade-off is that we're selling off our assets. We're going into debt in order to indulge our presence. Foreigners give us the products that they make, and we give them stocks. We give them real estate. We give them bonds. But now they have assets. We have to pay interest. We have to pay dividends. We have to pay rent. So Americans are getting poorer as we you know, run these deficits, and our trading partners are getting richer. And so in the end, these chickens are coming home to roost. And I guess the sooner that we can address the problem, the better, because we stop digging ourselves deeper into the hole. But the sooner we address the problems, the sooner we have to come to terms of reality. And we have to see a very, very big drop in our standard of living. And, you know, Americans are not going to like that. You know, I mean, nobody likes that. And, and, and politicians don't want that. I mean, Trump promised everything was going to be great, right? If he was president... We'd be we'd win so much we'd be tired of losing. Well, you know, well, I mean, tired of winning. We'd want to lose, right? We'd be we'd be so bored of winning all the time. So Trump doesn't want to preside over a major decline in our standard of living. But ultimately, that has to happen because this is the consequence of all the excess consumption that went on before he was president. You know, we we we, we sacrificed our future to indulge our past, and we're now we've now the future is now the present. We're here. You know, and it's time to pay the piper. All right.